Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the state attorney general wants Corporation Commission Chair Susan Bittersmith out of office. And Commissioner Bob Burns wants APS to disclose all political donations. Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Ilya Rao of the Arizona Republic, Bob Christie of the Associated Press, and Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times. Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich is calling for Corporation Commission Chairwoman Susan Bittersmith's removal from office petitions the Supreme Court says she never should have been there in the first place, huh? He did. Susan Bittersmith actually is a lobbyist for a group that kind of advocates for uh, telecommunications, cable, TV, um, telephone, stuff like that. And basically he sent a letter saying she never should have been in office. She doesn't, you know, it's a conflict of interest. She needs to be out. Uh, she lobbies again for the cable, but she says, I'm lobbying for cable TV, not for things that are regulated by the commission. That's correct. The, the state constitution says that you can't, uh, you can't sit on the corporation commission if you have an interest in any of the things that they regulate. They do not regulate cable television. They do regulate telephone companies. And nowadays, as we all know, uh, cable companies sell telephone service and, and Cox Communications who she lobbies for, and the Southwest Cable Communications Association. I may have messed that up, the, that formal term of their of the lobbying group for the cable companies. Their membership also sells telephone. So what uh, the Attorney General says is, by definition, she represents an, an entity that is regulated, and she therefore was not, never qualified for office and should be immediately removed. And the Attorney General's uh, office also, in his petition, says or argues that it, this uh, a petition of yours, or this case against Peter Smith, can't be cured even if she uh, uh, resigns from her post uh, in those companies. Um, because at the time that she was elected into office, she was already lobbying for those entities, and those entities either are regulated by the commission or have subsidiaries or affiliate companies that are also regulated by the Corporation Commission. Therefore, the only remedy for her would be to quit her post or in this case get removed by the Supreme Court. Was this a surprise? Was the wording a surprise? I don't think it was a surprise. There have been complaints before against Bittersmith, actually from uh, at least one private citizen and uh, some attorneys and stuff kind of getting involved. So it's something that's been going around. It's, it was interesting that, yeah, you have a Republican Attorney General kind of getting in the middle of it. He's getting uh, some criticism for it, primarily because she is one of the corporation commissioners who is been a little bit willing to kind of be a little more critical of APS. So, well, that's an interesting point. I mean, you could kind of, if you really want to dig deep on this thing and kind of wonder about machinations, you could say, well, wait a minute now, <laughs> this could be APS saying, let's get rid of Bittersmith. Uh, yeah, if, if one were to really go deep down the rabbit hole, um, you know, w Bittersmith's lawyers, uh, back in September, a private attorney, Tom Ryan, who has, has been involved around a little bit, filed a complaint with the Attorney General and with laying out all these facts that she was a, uh, had worked as a lobbyist for Cox, that she's currently executive director of the Cable Association and therefore she shouldn't be allowed to stay in office and never was qualified for office. Uh, you know, us pol political watchers kind of felt, well, the chances of the Attorney General, who's a fellow Republican taking that up, were, were probably slim. She vehemently denied it through her attorney. She says, this was an attack by the solar companies on me. Um, and then this week, when the attorney general asked her to be removed, the same attorney says, no, it's an attack by a Democrat who wants my seat. So, uh, you know, we'll see yeah. how we get there. Yeah, if you really want to go down this rabbit hole, if you will. <laughs> so this yeah. came about because it, was, it came as a tip from a nonprofit organization that is funded by Renewable Energy Interest that's based in Washington, D.C., and they've been going after the Corporation Commission, specifically Bob Stump and his text messages. Now, in their process of going after Bob Stump, they tipped off KJAS and said, look, Bittersmith had these ties to these companies. And as a result of that, Tom Ryan, the attorney from the East Valley, filed the complaint against the uh, attorney, uh, against Bittersmith with, uh, with the attorney general's office. But you see, here's the thing. You, can, you cannot accuse Mark Brunovitz of being a liberal, a lefty, 
or uh, being a pawn of solar interest. I mean, this guy came from the Goldwater Institute. If you're talking about staunch conservatism, this is a very conservative uh, lawyer, and, and therefore, uh, even if she is claiming that it's politically motivated, the fact that we have a Republican who is staunchly conservative going after her and saying, look, this is a clear-cut case. You violated the state's conflict of interest, interest statutes, and therefore you should resign. I don't see how really the, you know, the, the, the accusation or the allegation by her, by her uh, that this is politically made of motivated sticks. If, if he says, he says the law clearly prohibits her from holding office, pretty much means she's always been ineligible to hold the job. What becomes of her decisions? I mean, are, are, do those stick? Do they, they stand? They do stick. Um, and the attorney general made a point of that as to, as to the assistant attorney general who brought, who actually filed the case. The, there is a, a legal theory, and I forget the actual term. I but think it's called de facto officer. Right. It, it means that if you're sitting, if you were, if you thought you were sitting legally, and everybody else thought you were sitting legally, then the the decisions you made are, stand. And in fact, you know, the question was raised not just about her past votes, but also her future votes. Now that she is under her, her legitimacy is under question, what happens to her future votes? And the same legal theory, legal concept applies. And that's why the Attorney General's office went directly to the U.S., uh, rather the U.S. State Supreme Court and said, look, you need, you need to take up this case. You need to uh, find a remedy right away because in the meantime, she is making all these decisions, these important policy decisions when she may not be legitimately holding that office. If those policy decisions should go against my particular concerns, I can't come back and sue the commission and say, you know, you made the decision, but you knew you were making the decision when this person was uh, being suspected of conflict of interest. Well, under this theory, you can't. You can't. Okay. Under this theory, those votes, whatever they are, would be legitimate. Even now? Even, Even now, right. yes. Okay. And that's why there's, the Attorney General is, is adamant that this case be taken up immediately and resolved right. quickly. Will it be taken the, up immediately? Well, the Supreme Court has not formally taken the case yet. They have put it on their calendar, their, their uh, roundtable calendar, their discussion calendar, for early in January, they've asked for a briefing from both sides. So the first week of January, they will hold a, a meeting, closed door meeting. They'll decide whether to take the case. There's a couple different things they can do. They can reject the case. They can they can send it to the Superior Court to build a case file, which could take months and months and years. Or they could uh, they could uh, set briefing and help oral arguments and make a decision. Or they could uh, decide it right on the papers. All right. We'll see how far that goes. another. Corporation Commission story involves another commissioner, Bob Burns, who now has decided he wants to see APS political donations and he wants to see those donations in 30 days. APS political donations, right. which is uh, of major import here because it doesn't include something else, does it? It doesn't include his letter. He sent the letter. It doesn't include the parent company, Pinnacle West. So he would get the donations that APS directly submit, theoretically submitted, but he wouldn't get any donations that APS, that uh, Pinnacle West is a parent company made. And we know they made donations. I mean, but, but the idea is that, that APS is where the taxpayer dollars, or the ratepayer dollars go in, whereas Pinnacle West, maybe not? That's his theory, kind of, but there's still taxpayer dollars in Pinnacle West. Right. So the, after we asked Bob Burns that question, why did you ask these questions, this data only from the Arizona Public Service and not from Pinnacle West, which is the company that owns APS and therefore, in theory, is not directly regulated by the Corporation Commission? Well, he basically said, well, he, not basically, he said, I'm doing this one step at a time. Now I'm asking APS. I'm waiting for their response. Um, whatever the response is, my next step would be to ask Pinnacle West to provide me this data. And if both APS and Pinnacle West do not or refuse to give me the, the information I'm asking, I'm going to subpoena uh, th this information. And I would imagine that if he requests this from APS and in 30 days he comes back and APS says, look, nothing, we did absolutely nothing, he's going to go after, someone's got to go after Pinnacle West. They'll I mean, probably go after Pinnacle West. And if APS is actually the, the, the you know, APS has never confirmed or denied that they actually spent the money in the Corporation Commission la last year. Uh, there were two, uh, $3.2 million, I believe, that were spent to back uh, two Corporation Commissioners. Uh, everybody thinks it's APS. Everybody suspects it's APS. No one has any confirmation and for that it is APS, but they haven't denied it. Right. So this has been murking out there for a long time now. Yeah, I think, I think they, it's very clear that Bob Burns is going to go after Pinnacle West after, and if he doesn't get what he wants, he'll subpoena 
uh, these uh, these companies. Right. Well, they, it's clear it's clear he can get APSs because they are a regulated utility, and and the Corporation Commission has the ability to look at their books at any time, or any commissioner can look at their books. What? But the criticism is why now? I mean, people have been asking them to do this, and the Corporation Commission has the authority, whereas under state law they don't have to disclose. But people have been asking him to do this for a year, and the question is, why now? Why, well, why now? Well, <laughs> in his uh, in his letter to Don Brandt, he's saying, look. This perception that APS has funded the election or helping the election of two regulated um, two regulators is coloring the perception of the public of the corporation commission. But it's been doing this for months. Right. Really. This is hardly and, news. Right. And I think it's getting to a point where he feels he needed to do something. Now, just to backtrack a bit, Bob Burns has always been wary of um, not just electioneering spending by APS or any utility for that matter, but he's always been wary of regulated entities spending money. Uh, that is not directly related to the cost of service, and that means they're spending money that's beyond what's necessary to provide electricity or telecom, or whatever the regulated uh, service is. He's saying they shouldn't even be providing services, or rather providing funding to outreach programs, community projects. He's always been wary of that, and I think it came to a head when all these allegations uh, that had, as you know, had started uh, a year ago, uh, they just kept on piling on. And at that point, at one point, I think he decided he needed to do something about it. Did right. he decide he needed to do something about it because maybe something was in the wind that APS wasn't happy with Bob Burns? I, I don't know. You know, that's all background. We don't really know what the noise is. Now, he was on your program, was it three months ago? And at about the same time that he sent a letter to all the public service corporations in the state, all the cable companies and Tucson Electric and the others, saying, Please voluntarily refrain from election spending. And Bob Brandt, the CEO of APS and Pinnacle West, sent him back a letter saying, sorry, Don Brandt, said, sorry, we will not give up our First Amendment rights under any condition, which kind of set the stage and says, all right, go ahead and, you know, try us, which now Bob Burns has done. Um, and we'll see what happens next. And I think, mm -hmm. I think ultimately we'll go to court, uh, or this thing ends up in court. I think uh, there are already indications from APS that they are not going to give up this information without a fight, and I think it goes to court. The APS information or something in later with Pinnacle West? I think both. I think uh, because Bob Burns is preparing to actually um, ask for information from not just APS but Pinnacle West and then maybe g get a subpoena. I think, uh, you know, in the end, we will we will see this thing end up in court. It does taint the commission. I mean, the, the fact that... It's tainted no the commission for a year. I mean, goodness <laughs> great. We don't do any stories about the great work the Corporation Commission's doing. That's, that's right. And they're, they're supposed to be the taxpayer advocate, the, the ratepayer advocate, the consumer advocate, who makes sure that, that these companies that have vast power and have monopolies granted by the state are, are only getting a fair amount of return. And when you, when you have a suspicion that they are electing the people who are regulating them, it just looks bad. Uh, state uh, Senator Kelly Ward is now an ex-state senator. As she soon, soon, soon will be. And, and wants to become a U.S. senator, obviously, in a race against, any surprise here? Not really, I mean, she's gotta run a statewide, way, statewide race, and she's running against John McCain. So this is a state senator who's from Lake Havasu City. She's known in her district, but in terms of statewide recognition, she has a lot of work to kind of get that name attention. Does this indicate optimism that maybe she's got something here and if she gives it some, you know, her full attention, she can go somewhere or otherwise? That's a hard question to answer. I, you know, I think it, it indicates that she's got a lot of work to do. I, I really think it's, it's otherwise maybe realizing that you can't do, you can't juggle both. She kind of got the education special session under her belt, but to start a new session and to try and campaign in a statewide race is, you know. It's re it really is a full-time job. Look, her, her main problem is raising money. That's what she needs to do. She needs to raise money, and she needs to m make sure that she can, at the very least, compete with John McCain. John McCain expected to have lots of money. He's going he's gonna to his campaign's going to flood airways. There's going to be a lot of negative campaigning that's expected uh, next year. If you can't even comp compete, really, you know, you don't stand a chance. You don't, but, but uh, Bob, most folks don't think she stands a chance anyway, and you've already got your Senate seat. So you can do some work there in the, in the, in the Arizona legislature. Uh, what's going on here? You know, good question. Um, you know, one, if one looks at it, she's got, uh, she raised, I think, a half a million dollars, and Tom, John McCain's sitting on 500000 She loses her bully pulpit if she steps down from the Senate. 
So she can't, you know, hold a press conference at the state capitol and say, look what the bill had introduced and this is why you should send me the Senate. Right. So it, it's real questionable as to whether it's a good move, smart move. We'll see. All right. Uh, Elliot, what is the Classrooms <coughs> First Initiative Council and why did they miss their deadline this week? This is a group that Governor Doug Ducey set up basically saying, our school funding formula is 35 years old, it's completely convoluted mess, they sort of just shoved charter schools in there in terms of funding and we need to look at it and redo it. So basically this group has spent six months looking at the school funding formula and they were supposed to make final recommendations this week and they basically said we need more time. The last group that did this spent two years, we've spent six months, give us another six to nine months and let us kind of finish the work on redoing this formula. You give us six to nine months so we can finish the work and so what, we don't bother the governor? Don't get in his, don't, don't I think annoy the, him the, or something? The, I think the prevailing sentiment is that this, uh, this, this committee, this group has deliberately uh, delayed uh, providing recommendations in order to not to muck up, if you will, this very big initiative that's going to be before the voters in May. And, you know, politically, you know, that's a very smart move. Uh, would they muck it up? I mean, uh, I think you would because you know, think about it. You know, the, we have all these different formulas that go into, you know, what it, what it, one individual school or school district gets paid for each student. So there's a classrooms, there's basic school aid, there's transportation funding, there's five or six other things that all go into this big mix. And when you start messing with them, there's going to be winners and losers, and you don't want the losers to say, you're you're messing with us. So they do have some ideas, though. We've, we've had some general uh, recommendations, correct? They do. I mean, there's a recognition that something needs to be done to attract and retain teachers. You know, we need some mentoring. We need to look at salaries. We need some stuff like that. There's some suggestion that we need to rehash sort of how schools get money. Right now, you're giving the worst performing schools money. They think you should give the best performing schools money and then maybe the best performing low income schools even more money. And the difference between charter schools and districts, traditional school districts, I mean the idea that charters can't do overrides and this school districts can, but charters get more state money than, so, I mean it, it is really a mess. And the broader goal the governor has said is to basically create one formula that works for everybody. So the question is though down the line, does that mean nobody can bond? Does that yeah. mean, what does that mean yeah. and what does that look like and yeah, who's right. the winner and who's and, the loser? And really the way to do it, I mean, you had to put more money into the system. Right. And and I don't think the governor's willing to put more money beyond what he's going to put in into the system. So And in talking about putting in more money into the system, I think the elephant one elephant in the room is Prop 301, the fact that tax expiring in the next couple of years here. I mean, this committee uh, is at the very least uh, uh, expected to do something or not do something, at least delve into, you know, what we do with Prop 301. My thinking is that Prop 301 probably gets extended and of course who who gets to carry that ball is the question uh, but but somebody will have to all right um, uh, Jeff DeWitt the treasurer thinks <coughs> he is the one who has to tell the governor and those who support the idea of using the state land trust it's not that easy you're gonna need congressional approval to use the, the plan that the governor has and now that the we're gonna see on the ballot here uh, next year because you're messing or you're mucking around with the enabling act that gave us all the land in the first place that's correct he went in front of what's called the legislative council which writes ballot language which is made up of lawmakers primarily Republican lawmakers um, yesterday and he argued two points one you're you're breaking the enabling act because the way this is set up you're, you're going into the principle of the fund, and the principle of the fund cannot be diminished under the trust, into the, under the Enabling Act. Um, John Shattig, former congressman who wrote the last change to the Enabling Act, got up there and said, nope, you can do whatever you want. I wrote the law. I know, I know what it says. Um, the governor's attorney got up there and said, this is just fine. The other thing is that uh, Jeff DeWitt wanted language in, in, in the actual, that's going to go to voters, going to get mailed out to voters here in a month or so, that laid out this issue, the fact that there is a, in, some doubt in his mind whether this is legal and whether it requires congressional is approval. Is there some doubt in, uh, in other attorneys' minds? Obviously, those who support this say there's no problem. The 19, was a change in 1999 gave states more control. We've got that side of the argument. DeWitt, is DeWitt the lone wolf out there? Is anyone else saying this? He's not the lone wolf. There seems to be consensus among constitutional experts that there's a question. But they think it could go either way. It's basically an issue that eventually the court should probably figure out. 
the question is, are they going to figure out with Arizona, or, or is everybody going to kind of let it go and we'll see what happens and, next? And in fact, John Shaddy yesterday during his testimony said that both Jeff DeWitt and the governor uh, have potentially valid interpretations of the change that Congress did in 1999. Now, in 1999, Congress basically said how the fund is distributed uh, is going to be referred back to the state constitution. The thinking uh, by the governor's office is that because Congress wrote or amended the Enabling Act that way, and therefore you could amend how the fund is distributed. Yeah. Of course, Jeff DeWitt is saying, no, because it doesn't explicitly say, explicitly say in that uh, Congressional Act in 1999 that you could do it, uh, 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 that you could amend without uh, congressional approval. So very quickly, we only got a few seconds left here, why don't you just go to Congress and say, oh, approve it? They, they could do that. The problem is, what happens if the whole Arizona delegation doesn't agree? Well, how, what if you get a few Democrats or a, few, a couple Republicans who say, I think Jeff DeWitt's right. I don't think we should change this law. This is damaging the, the thing that's supposed to last forever, supporting Arizona schools. But you still got to figure that Congress would overall, the make of Congress now, would they, say probably okay. They probably would pass And it, I would get there as quickly as possible. Yes. Yeah. But that's, that's another yeah. layer of complication. I don't think they want to go there. All right. Well, we got to stop right here. Uh, good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You. Have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.